Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. In 1968, Wallace Pharmaceuticals ran an ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association for its extremely popular medication, Milltown. In the left panel, a shrunken woman in a dress and apron looks distressed while her giant son looks ready to throw an alphabet building block at her. The block is part of a set that spells out tension. On the right panel, a banner headline reads, Syndromes of the 60s, the Battered Parent Syndrome. The text of the advertisement is like Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, filtered through the brains of a Mad Men-style ad team. You can practically smell the Lucky Strikes and the Scotch. The woman in question, pictured in the lower right, is the, quote, paradox of our modern age. The ad goes on to describe the middle-aged woman of the 60s as, quote, compared to her mother, she has more education, more usable income, and more labor-saving devices. Yet, she is physically and emotionally overworked, overwrought, and, by the time you see her, overwhelmed. What went wrong? Is parenthood something other than the rosy fulfillment pictured by the women's magazines? Is anxiety and tension fast becoming the occupational disease of the homemaker? Some say it's unrealistic to educate a woman and then expect her to be content with the Cub Scouts as an intellectual outlet, or to grant that she is socially, politically, and culturally equal while continuing to demand domestic and biological subservience or to expect her to shoulder the guilt burden of this child-centered age without unraveling around the edges, or to compete with her husband's job for this time and involvement. But whatever the cause, the consequences, anxiety, tension, insomnia, functional disorders, fill waiting rooms. Sometimes it helps to add Milltown to her treatment to help her relax her emotional and muscular tension. (laughs) Isn't that just... Wow. So is your wife frigid? (laughs) Does your wife not want to... (laughs) Give her a pill. (laughs) That's what it says to me. Basically. (laughs) (laughs) And I got to tell you, to expect her to shoulder the guilt burden of this child-centered age without unraveling around the edges, like that's hitting a little close to home right now. A little bit cuckoo right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Milltown, the minor tranquilizer first released in the early 1950s, was immediately hailed a wonder drug. It was prescribed for tension, what we would now call anxiety, but also for allergies, asthma, and a whole host of other issues. A quick scan of Milltown advertisements in 1950s and 60s medical journals will show it marketed to practitioners to ease the stresses of pregnancy, heart disease, parenting, working women, PMS, chronic disease, and even the incredibly vague, quote, byproducts of the new industrial revolution. And it wasn't just Milltown. Major tranquilizer Thorazine, other minor tranquilizers Librium and Valium, Energizers, Vivactyl, Triavil, and Aventil, Sedative, Budasol, and Stimulant Ritalin, among many others, all hit the market in the 1950s and 60s. No wonder Bruce Jackson wrote in The Atlantic in 1966 that Americans think in terms of pills. How did Americans come to think in terms of pills? Today, as part of our drug series, we are talking about the rise of psychopharmaceuticals. I'm Sarah. And I'm going crazy. (laughs) And I'm Elizabeth. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. So first, let's start with a bit of background about the history of psychiatry. We'll need it to understand why happy pills like Milltown were so important. For centuries, the study of the mind and mental illness wasn't necessarily considered a distinct specialty within the medical profession. The ancient doctors like Hippocrates, Galen, Avicenna, Celsus, and others all wrote about mental illness alongside physical illness in their treatises. 
And the ancient theory of humoralism, which we've talked about many times, but in short is the theory that the body contains four humors or fluids that balance with each other and their balance or imbalance was what made you healthy or sick, was used to understand both psychological and physical health. Since everyone had a slightly different humoral makeup, their personal blend affected their personality. Someone with a balance that tipped towards the blood humor usually had a sanguine personality, meaning they were talkative, happy, active, and social. Someone who tipped more towards yellow bile was considered choleric or ambitious, short-tempered extroverts. This theory of medicine and health, which continued to dominate the medical world well into the 19th century, saw the physical and mental as uh, inextricably entwined. If your humors were out of whack, it meant ailments for both body and mind. Even after the humoral theory started to fall out of favor, the connection between body and mind remained an absolute within the medical profession. In the 19th century, for instance, historian Nancy Tomes noted that both families and physicians described physical ills or imbalances in their descriptions of a patient's mental illness, menopause, hemorrhoids, a tooth extraction, rheumatism, and the, quote, morbid state of the bowels, that sounds awful, were all <laughs> common causes of insanity. In other words, the physical body's health was the mind's health. It's really amazing how often the state of one's bowels are considered the cause of psychological distress. Lots of people were constipated. Yeah, I was going to say, when you're constipated, you're not in the, the nicest yeah. frame of mind. So. That's right. <laughs> and I mean, maybe before, maybe before the modern toilet conveniences that we have now, it was much more stressful than it is today. <laughs> Probably, <You> yes. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> But while doctors continued to see a connection between body and mind, the idea that the mind was the domain of all doctors changed with the rise of the asylum. Institutions for the mentally ill have existed for hundreds of years, but for most of their history, they were more like almshouses, a catch-all social safety net. For instance, London's infamous Bethlehem Hospital, better known as Bedlam, began its long life as a kind of public house dedicated to the care of the needy, including the mentally ill, but also the impoverished, sick, widowed, orphaned, and disabled. As was the case for most disabled people before the 18th century, mentally ill people typically lived at home, working alongside their family in the capacity they could, or receiving in-home care. By the 18th century, however, institutions exclusively for the mentally ill began to appear. The Industrial Revolution in both Europe and the United States made it increasingly difficult for families to care for mentally ill family members who might need constant supervision or intensive care. It might have been possible to provide this kind of support when the whole family more or less worked at home together, say, on a farm or in a blacksmith's shop, but this became impossible when most members of the family had to venture out during the day for factory work or labored at home doing piecework. Families needed someplace to take a mentally disabled relative, and in response, asylums that specialized in the housing and ostensibly treatment of the mentally ill began to proliferate. With the asylums came a new profession, psychiatry. Asylums hired physicians to serve as superintendents, overseeing the care and treatment of inmates. While they didn't really call themselves psychiatrists yet, doctors who worked in asylums started to understand themselves as distinct within the larger medical profession. In 1844, the superintendents of 13 of the most influential asylums in the United States founded an organization for asylum superintendents and gave it the worst name in the history of acronyms, the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane, AMSAI. A -M -S yeah, the A-M-S-A-I-I, -I, which is just impossible to say. It's a long name to begin with. Uh, the organization, influenced by the work of founding member Thomas Story Kirkbride, established its own professional journal, the American Journal of Insanity, headquartered in the New York State Lunatic Asylum at Utica. It encouraged research into mental illness and therapies and drafted guidelines for best practices for asylum architecture and building. 
They implemented Thomas Kirkbride's own plan for the effective treatment of the mentally ill, called the moral treatment, which relied on the salutary effects of fresh air, exercise, sunny interiors, and a soothing environment. The AMSAII effectively... <laughs> The AMSAII effectively marked the birth of the American psychiatric profession. Uh, just a footnote here to say, yes, if you're going to write in and say that Kirkbride did not invent the moral treatment, I know that. But there's only so much that you can pick, pack into one episode. <laughs> Problems for the profession began to arise toward the end of the 19th century, though. As the name suggests, the AMSAII was almost synonymous with the asylum. Psychiatrists were almost entirely based out of asylums. While these positions might have been prestigious in the early 19th century, they started to lose their shine as the century wore on. Asylums, even those built to Kirkbride's specifications for ideal therapeutic effect, were plagued with overcrowding. Despite their attempts to conduct research and develop effective treatments, superintendents were consistently plagued with what they called chronic cases, or patients whose condition did not improve enough to allow for their release from the institution. Now, I'm oversimplifying here for the sake of time. This was complex and was often the fault of the doctors themselves who flexed their professional muscle by refusing to let patients leave even when they themselves reported that they were feeling better. But to deal with the overcrowding, superintendents petitioned state governments to build yet more asylums specifically for the chronically ill. An example of this is the Willard Asylum in upstate New York, in, in Ovid, in the uh, Finger Lakes. These institutions weren't concerned with medical treatment as much as with economics. They often used patients for domestic and agricultural labor to keep the asylum solvent. And yes, of course, they framed this as therapeutic in and of itself. The fact that so many patients were deemed incurable to the point where asylums literally could not hold them all was bad for the profession. It only served to prove that psychiatrists were not effectively treating their patients. It also meant that increasingly superintendents were not practicing medicine. By the end of the century, the superintendents running large state mental hospitals were no longer at the cutting edge of medicine like their AMSAII forebears were. Instead, they were essentially administrators with MDs. They supervised the business of the asylum, which often included active farms or other related businesses. They managed hordes of attendants, nurses, cooks, janitors, and other staff, and shuffled piles of mail and paperwork. Overcrowding also meant that it was nearly impossible to actually provide treatment. There was simply too many patients. When investigative reporter Nellie Bly went undercover in the Blackwell's Island Asylum, she reported that each asylum building held at least 300 women, and each bedroom held up to 10. Most of the day-to-day, quote-unquote, care of patients was left to nurses, who were themselves frustrated and overworked, resulting in cruelty and mismanagement. Desperate to maintain control, Attendants often resorted to restraints like straitjackets, Utica cribs, or locked rooms to keep patients easy to manage. As the psychiatrist superintendents were becoming less doctor and more administrator, they also started to suffer from competition. After the Civil War, the new medical specialty of neurology began to focus on the brain as the cause of much mental illness and advocated for new ways of understanding and treating it. Doctors who had served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, like S. Weir Mitchell, began to criticize establishment psychiatry for its failures. These former Army doctors had seen firsthand how traumatic injury resulted in nerve damage that could cause phenomena that mimicked mental illness, like phantom limb pain, which Mitchell studied extensively. In 1894, Mitchell excoriated the psychiatric profession in a speech, accusing them of being backward, anti-scientific monarchs who didn't bother to do even the bare minimum to actually treat their patients. Neurologists, on the other hand, were the real doctors, advancing the study of the brain and identifying the specific and physical underlying causes of mental illness. Moreover, neurologists worked outside the asylum in private practice, which typically made them both famous and wealthy. 
Mitchell himself, of course, was the father of the infamous rest cure that he used to treat Charlotte Perkins Gilman for neurasthenia, resulting in the classic short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. And we'll come back around to uh, Mitchell and the rest cure towards the end of the episode. All of this, so seeing the failure of Kirkbride's moral treatment as chronic cases piled up and frustrated with their stagnant roles as administrators, led to psychiatrists developing something of an inferiority complex. During the last half of the 19th century, medical science was advancing at what seemed like a startling pace. Joseph Lister innovated antisepsis, John Snow knows nothing. He revolutionized <laughs> public health. Louis Pasteur articulated germ theory. Robert Koch identified the tubercule bacillus, and we could go on and on. Yet psychiatry had changed very little from the beginning of the century. While treatments they offered might have changed a little, the reality was that the real therapy psychiatrists offered was still little more than institutionalization, and that was failing. In 1909, the work of doctor scientist Paul Ehrlich resulted in the discovery of salversan, an antimicrobial agent that killed the spirochete that caused syphilis. The treatment, Ehrlich declared, was a magic bullet, and within a few decades, medicine became increasingly focused on the quest for magic bullets, that one treatment could cure or eradicate some of the world's most deadly diseases. In the 1930s, scientists at the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company created sulfonamide, another antimicrobial that effectively treated staphylococcus and streptoco streptococcal bacterial infections. And of course, in 1928, Alexander Fleming famously left his Petri dishes sitting out when he went on vacation and came back to discover penicillin on them, resulting in the early 1940s with the magic bullet of them all antibiotics. What psychiatry needed was a magic bullet. But they had an even bigger problem. They didn't even know what the germ was for a magic bullet to kill. In other words, how could they develop a magic bullet for diseases that didn't have a clear or identifiable origin? Psychiatrists desperate to find somatic or physical origin and treatment for mental illness began to experiment with a wide variety of treatments, sort of like throwing spaghetti at the wall, just to see what stuck. They tried high-pressure showers and very long, hot baths. One physician in Scotland treated a patient with a diet of sheep thyroids. Psychiatrist and asylum superintendent Henry Cotton maniacally removed his patient's teeth and sometimes even their internal organs like colons and their cervixes out of the belief that micro infections in the mouth or body caused insanity. Fun fact here, uh, just to take a little sidestep into Cotton's uh, totally nutso theories, he um, actually worried that he himself was going insane. And so he pulled out his own teeth to combat it. Pretty, seems, pretty neat guy. Seems healthy. Yeah, seems legit. By the 1930s and 40s, they had shifted focus to the brain. One treatment to reset the brain into rationality, this was generally the theory, right, that you wanted to kind of shock the person or reset the brain somehow. This is a kind of a theory of mental, a theory of the treatment of insanity that goes back hundreds of years. Um, but one treatment to do that involved giving patients an overdose of insulin, which put them into hypoglycemic comas. Electroconvulsive therapy, often called electroshock, and lobotomy, in which the brain's frontal lobe was destroyed with a literal ice pick forced through the eye socket, were also attempts to treat mental illness through the brain. These therapies were seen as having tremendous potential, but they soon fell out of favor or became the subject of harsh criticism. Lobotomy and insulin therapy were both soundly criticized and stopped being used widely in the early 1950s. And while electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is still used, its reputation was permanently tarnished by its role in the book and movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You can still actually get ECT today. What the profession needed was something that could provide the effect of these treatments, calmness, relaxation, and ultimately controllability, without the treatments that seemed so obviously barbaric. 
In 1949, French naval doctor Henri Labarette discovered that certain antihistamines caused sailors under his care to enter a euphoric quietude. French scientists then experimented with the drug until they created chlorpromazine, which, unlike existing drugs like barbiturates and morphine, had the power to sedate while allowing the patient to remain conscious. Their new drug became Thorazine, initially referred to as a major tranquilizer or neuroleptic, today considered an antipsychotic. Patients on the drug were conscious but sedate. One study described the effect this way, quote, seated or lying down, the patient is motionless on his bed, often pale with lowered eyelids. He remains silent most of the time. If questioned, he responds after a delay, slowly, in an indifferent monotone, expressing himself with few words and quickly becoming mute. Without exception, the response is generally valid and pertinent, showing that the subject is capable of attention and of reflection, but he rarely takes the initiative of asking a question. He does not express his preoccupations, desires, or preference. He is usually conscious of the amelioration brought on by the treatment, but he does not express euphoria. To be clear, Thorazine was not actually treating anything. In the words of one psychiatrist in the mid-1950s, quote, we have to remember that we are not treating diseases with this drug. We are using a neuropharmacologic agent to produce a specific effect. Effectively, Thorazine was actually what is now called a chemical restraint, a medication that is administered to restrict a patient's freedom of movement or for emergency control of behavior. Because it was a pretty heavy tranquilizer, it was most useful inside asylums. In an overcrowded, understaffed institution, control was more important than therapy, and Thorazine made patients easy to control. Patients on the drug sat still, stared, and did not feel the need to talk, making it significantly easier for attendants to keep large numbers of patients under control. It also gave the appearance of treatment. Patients might go from screaming, crying, or acting out in mania to quiet and compliant. Side note, this is also why antipsychotics are still very often used in nursing homes, not because the patients themselves are mentally ill, but because the drugs make it easier to deal with elderly people, especially those with dementia. As powerful as Thorazine was, its usefulness was limited to institutional and hospital settings because it was such a heavy tranquilizer. The real revolution came with meprobamate, produced by Czech scientist Frank Berger, who found during research on various compounds came upon a drug called mephenicin that caused his laboratory mice to relax and lose their fight reaction while remaining awake and responsive. In other words, a reaction similar to Thorazine, but, but, but without its more profound effects. Berger used this drug as the jumping off point for what eventually became the minor tranquilizer, what we call an anti-anxiety today, of Milltown. The company that founded the creation of Milltown, Carter Products, had a long history of producing patent medicines and thus was well-versed not only in how to develop drugs, but almost more importantly, how to market them. Carter Products admin marketed Milltown not as a sedative, but as a minor tranquilizer, specifically because it linked it to Thorazine. This new drug could provide the tension relief of the previous wonder drug to a broader population with its milder action. Within about a year, Milltown and its sister drug, Equinil, made up almost 70% of the tranquilizer market. These tranquilizers, along with benzodiazepines Librium and Valium, which came along soon after, were immediately described as psychiatric magic bullets. In 1954, Time magazine lauded Thorazine and called it as important as the germ-killing sulfas discovered in the 1930s. The New York Times called it a miracle. Milltown, according to Consumer Reports, quote, relaxes the muscles, calms the mind, and gives people a renewed ability to enjoy life. 
Milltown in particular became a commercial phenomenon, partly because Carter Products hired the Ted Bates and Company ad agency, which was famous for doing campaigns for Wonder Bread, M&M's, Colgate, Anison, and the presidential candidate Dwight Eisenhower. But the reason that the Bates agency was able to market Milltown so effectively requires another little sidestep into the history of psychiatry, this time to the guy who was almost become the doctor associated with psychiatry, Sigmund Freud. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> we would Have you need... ever seen that? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Have you ever seen that episode of Friends where Joey is in a play about Freud? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what you need is a thing <laughs> what you need is a wang okay sorry go on <laughs> oh no please continue <laughs> we would need an entire additional episode to really talk about freud and the history of his theory of psychoanalysis so we're sort of skipping over all the details and if you want an episode on that of course let us know but essentially, what you need to know here is that in the mid 20th century, almost all psychiatrists in private practice used Freudian theories and methods. These doctors, also called analytic and psychological, or AP doctors, were the ones who spent hours in talk therapy with their patients, attempting to gain insight using methods like dream analysis and free association. On the other hand, most of the doctors who worked in the state hospitals, as asylums had come to be called in the mid-20th century, were directive and organic, or DO doctors, who were focused much more on changing behaviors through quick, usually group therapy sessions and organic means like electroshock or major tranquilizers. I'm going to interrupt world... you for a second. Um, I I just wanted to say that the the DO doctors they're they're much more concerned with getting people's behavior to change so that they can better fit into society or better fit into the the population of the hospital. So they don't actually care all that much about like digging down deep into someone's neuroses and trying to like find the original thing that caused the problem. Like they don't have time for that. So they're just, they're much more concerned with like getting people functional again yeah, yeah, so that they can get them out of the hospital. Population. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So not to say that they necessarily weren't, they didn't care about it. They just didn't have time to care about it. Right, yeah. I don't know. Throw them a bone. Maybe, maybe <laughs> not. Maybe they don't deserve a bone. Um, okay. The World Wars had given the Freudians an interesting position and perspective. Thousands of soldiers returned with what had been dubbed shell shock, which was certainly disabling, but typically did not require hospitalization except in particularly severe cases. This boosted the position of those in private practice and shifted the profession towards Freudian analysis. It also meant an increased emphasis on Freudian ways of interpreting symptoms. Psychiatrists increasingly talked about anxiety as the underlying cause for all neuroses, which was a term that referred to basically all disorders that didn't involve psychosis. And in 1951, the Freudians had a powerful hold over the committee that wrote and published the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM-1, meaning that the resulting diagnoses used by AP and DO psychiatrists alike were strongly influenced by Freudian theories. Freudian theory was based on the idea of psychodynamics, or the idea that your behaviors or neuroses today are based on underlying causes. This is where we get the classic image of the psychiatrist sitting on a chair asking a patient who's usually reclining on a couch about their mother. And one theory within psychodynamics is psychosomatic theory, which states that underlying emotions or stresses actually manifest in physical symptoms, ranging from muscle soreness to heart palpitations to ulcers. I just have to say that uh, I dated a guy once who every time he had a bad day or every time he was stressed out, he would say, oh, I had an ulcer today, oh, which is like idiot, not how ulcers work. <laughs> But it also speaks to how we still think that ulcers are caused by stress and anxiety, which they are not. They are caused by um, infection. Anyway. So why is it then, is it, is it the infection is, is um, like 
hurt by stress then? It probably. Like, does, probably but, in the same may, way that when that you're just, stressed, no. like your your immune system is is Weaker. made worse by stress. Yeah. In any instance, right? I don't know. I'm not an ulcer doctor. But <laughs> give, me, give me the deets here. <laughs> all, there, all that we all that we need to know is that my ex boyfriend was dumb. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this was another development in the long belief that the psychological and physical were intertwined. By the 1960s, the concept of anxiety and its connection to an endless variety of bodily symptoms were mainstream, which meant that. Everyone and anyone was in need of psychiatric intervention. This meant that the potential market for Milltown was enormous. In his book, Happy Pills in America, David Hertzberg details numerous studies that appeared in the 1950s and 60s declared that nearly everyone needed psychological help. One study of office visits found that tens of millions of people had gone to their doctors with psychiatric complaints. A study done at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City found that an overwhelming majority of patients who presented with difficult to diagnose ailments actually had, quote, psychological factors as the basis for their complaints and illnesses. Hertzberg even writes that, quote, by the mid 1960s, conventional wisdom held that up to half of all patients seen in general practice were free of organic illness. They're suffering entirely psychological. So when those minor tranquilizers like Milltown and Equinil hit the market, the ad teams tapped into the idea that nearly everyone in American society needed these drugs for either or both psychological and physical reasons. Milltown could help with mental stress and tension that accompanied other ailments. People with heart disease or allergies needed drugs to help them with their underlying stress, which would in turn help them recover physically. The new minor tranquilizer, Atarax, was advertised in the Journal of American Medical Association for pediatric use, including tantrums and bedwetting. Equinil ads asserted that anxiety is part of every illness and included the tagline, in every patient, in every illness. While this was a gift to pharmaceutical companies like Carter, it held a potential threat for the Freudian psychiatrists. Drugs, they believed, were the domain of the D.O. doctors, who used them largely as chemical restraints in psychotic residential patients. Freudians didn't want to think of themselves as doling out tranquilizers like doctors in those overcrowded, underfunded, and frankly, horrific state hospitals. They also worried that drugs like Milltown would hurt their bottom line if patients could just pop a pill and not do the hard, and they thought, necessary work of psychoanalysis. Not to mention that they also were worried that patients would go to their primary physicians and get those prescriptions rather than going directly to psychiatrists. Advertisers responded by reassuring Freudian psychiatrists that drugs were just one tool that they could use to help their patients and that they would help to make particularly challenging cases more receptive to treatment. Psychiatrist and sociologist Jonathan Metzel found that drug ads began to use words like augment and adjunct. One Milltown ad had a banner that read, Milltown, an effective adjunct to psychotherapy, followed by the assurance that Milltown moderates tension and anxiety, affording better accessibility and rapport in psychotherapy. Historian Janet Walker analyzed dozens of these ads in her book, Couching Resistance, and found that these ads weren't just designed to reassure Freudians that their business wouldn't be stolen by pharmaceutical companies, but also to ass assuage their bruised male egos. Ads centered the psychiatrist's perspective and point of view, almost never depicting the medication visually at all. An ad for methadrine, a methamphetamine, assured doctors that the drug would help with male patients who will neither fit in with his surroundings nor cooperate to treatment, sympathizing with psychiatrists that such frustrating patients, quote, present an increasingly widespread problem in these anxiety-ridden times. Several ads are explicitly from the point of view of the doctor, such as one looking at the patient reflected in a doctor's eyeglasses, or another with the camera positioned behind him. That ad for the tranquilizer Sandril 
promised doctors that the drug would, quote, facilitate psychiatric treatment, making raging, combative, unsociable patients become more cooperative, friendlier, quieter, and much more amenable to psychotherapy and rehabilitation measures. Drugs, they promised, would make psychiatrists better at their jobs. While Aquinil advertisers declared that the minor tranquilizers were for every patient in every illness, they didn't really mean it. Ads emphasized complaints like tension, stress, worry, and nervousness, all bywords for the classic disease of the civilized classes of the Gilded Age, neurasthenia. We've talked about neurasthenia before. I think it was in our conservation episode. Um, maybe actually in a couple of different episodes. Yeah, I know we've talked about it a few times. I don't remember yeah. which one. But we'll give a quick recap. It was a diagnosis often given to people of the middle and upper classes who had symptoms that we today would probably associate with anxiety. They didn't use that word. Neurasthenia was a disease of civilization and modernity. The upper and middle classes were refined and used their brains for work instead of their brawn, which resulted in debilitating stress. While the diagnosis became old-fashioned, the crisis of anxiety in the post-World War II years in many ways became the new neurasthenia, a disease of the upper and middle classes. Milltown was ideal for brain workers, went one psychiatrist, who suffered from the tensions of a group of individuals who are by reason of their inherent qualities and training the finest product of our culture. Like the clerks and professionals of the Gilded Age, middle-class Americans suffered from the anxiety that came with their social status. People of color and the poor simply weren't sophisticated enough to suffer from anxiety. That logic also applied to the prescription of Milltown and other minor tranquilizers. Those with the delicate sensibilities of the civilized could be soothed with these gentle pills. The poor and the marginalized would be better institutionalized and heavily sedated. But unlike neurasthenia, anxiety could be treated with a little pill. Advertisers made it clear that anxiety was central to life as a middle-class American and that it was an individual problem that could be alleviated through the purchase of medicine, keying into the consumerist culture of the post-war. And having mental stress became a marker of being middle-class, keying into the conformist culture of the post-war. And while politicians, like Teddy Roosevelt, for instance, used neurasthenia as an indication that America needed systematic change, so remember TR claimed that America's over-civilized weakness could be alleviated through war and imperialism, anxiety made no such claim. It could be cured by popping a pill. Neurasthenia was also an intensely gendered disorder. Therapies were designed to make women more womanly and men more manly. Thus, S. Weir Mitchell's Rest Cure, which required that women lie in bed without any stimulation at all. No reading, writing, drawing, parenting, just complete rest. Which sounds kind of nice right now. <laughs> I was going to say that actually doesn't sound horrible. <laughs> but then again. But being forced to is a bit Right. Different. And today I would like, ha I would take the no reading, writing, etc. But I would like take Netflix, which you know, sadly, Charlotte Perkins Gilman did not have. Did not have. It forced women into an extreme and extremely distressing form of domesticity. After all, the experience traumatized Charlotte Perkins Gilman so significantly that she channeled her experience into the disturbing short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. Men, on the other hand, were encouraged to be more active and pushed towards manly pursuits like camping, hunting, fishing, and boxing. But the tranquilizers faced a gender dilemma. A pill is a pill. Both men and women can take it. So they needed to somehow make it appeal to both men and women. Initially, there was concern that tranquilizers would be harmful for men who needed to be vigorous to be successful. After all, that's what the treatments for neurasthenia for men emphasized, right? Men needed to get outside and be manly. One doctor wrote in a medical journal that, quote, our civilization has been built on the divine discontent of tense men and speculated that Columbus might not have ever bothered to sail the ocean blue in 1492 if he had been tranquilized by Milltown. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All that rape that would have been left out. Gosh. Right, right, right. 
Advertisers needed to find a new way to sell the drug to men that made it clear that it was still manly to be tranquilized. They hit on a truly amazing narrative. Men were actually so manly, so vigorous, and so full of drive that they needed help managing their instinct for a fight. One ad for Librium depicts two panels with what looks like a heart rate in front of it. On the left, a loincloth wearing caveman's heart rate spikes when he sees a tiger. On the right, a suit wearing businessman's heart rate spikes over and over because of the constant quote unquote threats of modern life. Men had evolved to react to these acute threats, but now smaller scale threats came constantly leaving men trapped in a high anxiety fight response. Tranquilizers would help them calm the restless animal within, as David Herzberg describes it. Women's use of tranquilizers, on the other hand, did not cause any gender anxieties. Just like in the age of neurasthenia, women needed to find a way to be happier and more content with their traditional role as mother and wife. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode an ad for Milltown that sold the tranquilizer to overwrought housewives using language that mimicked Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. Friedan used the language of neurasthenia to describe, quote, the problem that has no name or the mental distress of women who felt trapped by oppressive femininity. Friedan wrote with worry about the role that tranquilizers like Milltown were having on such women. One woman she interviewed for the book wrote about her experience with psychiatric drugs. You wake up in the morning and you feel as though there's no point in going on another day like this. So you take a tranquilizer because it makes you not care so much that it's pointless. Tranquilizers, like Mitchell's Rest Cure, were specifically marketed to help make women better adhere to the expectations of femininity. An ad for Vivactyl declared that it quote, first gets the patient moving, then gets her mood improving over an image of a woman carrying a laundry basket down the stairs. A decimal ad showed a woman hanging new floral curtains next to a headline that stated, regained an interest in her surroundings, a feeling of well-being. A butasol ad shows a mother in the kitchen smiling as a little girl ties her legs together as part of some kind of make-believe game and states, now she can cope. <laughs> By the end of the 1960s, drug ads were purposely tapping into for Dan's argument to sell the very drugs that she worried would further trap women. So when that Milltown ad seems like it's parroting for Dan's argument, it's because it literally was. That was not a mistake or a coincidence. It was It was actually based on Ferdinand, which is just truly next level. Yeah. One astonishing Cirax ad from 1969 depicts a woman surrounded by cleaning supplies. A broom and mop create the illusion that she's behind bars. The ad copy reads, you can't set her free, but you can make her feel less anxious. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> These ads pointed to a real conundrum in the American construction of femininity. Women, these ads declared, would be happier if they could just be better in their roles at housewife. But they also marketed Milltown and other tranquilizers specifically on the point that for a lot of women, that role wasn't really possible without chemical tranquilization. Through the 1960s and into the 70s, minor tranquilizers Librium and Valium were prescribed almost exclusively to women, and the drug companies stopped bothering trying to market them to men. So no wonder the Rolling Stones wrote a hit song about psychiatric drugs called Mother's Little Helper. The song is a little misogynistic. It criticizes women for popping pills when they're not really sick and have things easier uh, than women had in the past. So the women in the song bakes instant cakes and burns frozen steaks. In the 1970s, however, came the growing uneasy realization that minor tranquilizers were addictive and causing people to abuse their prescriptions. So famously, President Gerald Ford's wife, Betty, made a series of public appearances in the late 1970s where she appeared obviously drunk or high, slurring her words and stumbling. In 1978, she announced that she had been over-medicating and checked herself into a hospital. 
Later, she founded the Betty Ford Center, a treatment facility for those struggling with substance addiction. Once considered minor and perfect for busy moms and businessmen, now Valium and other minor tranquilizers were seen as potentially dangerous. Feminists in particular took on the overprescription of the drug, which seemed to be prescribed to women for just about every possible reason, from skin problems to vaginal pain. When TV producer Barbara Gordon kicked a Valium addiction in the 1970s, she went on the offensive, calling attention to sexist male doctors pushing drugs on women who they believed needed to be put back in their place, all while not warning them about the potential side effects. Women, she wrote, needed to stop being docile patients and take control over their own health. It's not a coincidence that this fight over Valium was happening at the same time as the women's health movement, which I talked about in that episode about witchcraft and midwifery. Eventually, Valium began to market itself as specifically not for everyday stresses, but instead for acute duress. But the market didn't let a vacuum develop where the minor tranquilizers had been. Enter the antidepressant Prozac. In fact, one psychiatrist went so far as to describe Prozac as a feminist wonder drug. It would help women succeed in a man's world. Prozac also empowered women, in a sense, by advertising directly to them, telling them to, quote, ask their doctor and putting the decision to seek out the drug in their hands. Instead of dulling women to their plight, Prozac, it was argued, opened them up to new possibilities. In the 70s and 80s, depression overtook anxiety as the psychic ailment of the masses and Prozac, the new wonder drug. I have such issue with Prozac becoming a, a catch-all for, for, for people over-abusing drugs. Valium or Prozac? Prozac. Okay. Because every time I read an article like or not every time now, but in my younger days, every time I yeah. read an article like that, I'd be like, I don't need Prozac. And I'd go off it and I'd wind up in the hospital. Oh. So I just want to yeah, give yeah. a, you know, a caveat to people who are listening Absolutely. that talk to your doctor. Yes, we are like... Uh, pushing back on doctors over prescribing. And that's absolutely the case. And we're dealing that with the opium epidemic right. for sure. But don't do this alone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, that's such an important point because a, a lot of the, the scholarship on this, um, it, it's very tricky to, to write about this because it was true that advertisers were pushing, very heavily pushing these medications. And in fact, one of the books that I read um, was by uh, a, a journalist named Robert Whitaker, who really heavily criticizes this. And in fact, he actually makes the argument that it creates the the drugs themselves create the mental illness. Like once you mm. be, once you start medicating, mm -hmm. you can never stop medicating because the medication itself messes with your system so much that it creates the problem it's prescribed to stop. Now, I will say Whitaker's book is like. You know, it, it's not maybe the the final word on this. This is just his argument. Right. Because I've um, heard I've heard people say that before. And then they right. take themselves off the medication to do it themselves. And exactly. They end up in big trouble. Right. And the thing that sometimes gets lost in this and this is I'm really glad you brought this up because this is a point that I, I wanted to make and it didn't make it into the, the copy is that often in in our scholarship about all of this stuff the patients themselves sort of disappear right right, right. so your experience is super important to this whole story about the ads and the the way that these just medications are marketed and prescribed and all this fight between like the psychiatrists and whatever like your you pointing that out is a reminder that somewhere in the mix of all this are patients who are hurting. Are, are hurting who are yeah. looking for help right yeah. yeah and so david hertzberg actually um sent me a chapter that he had written for a book in which um he's in his words he said he argued against his own book um yeah. where he kind of took the profession to task for not paying enough attention to the patients and instead sort of casting them as dupes who are just you know, allowing their doctors to prescribe them with medications right. they don't need. 
And he he says, you know, these are patients who are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They don't have access to, you know, regular psychiatric like, you know, psychotherapy or something like not everybody has the time and the money and everything to go have cognitive behavioral therapy. Some patients, that's not going to help them anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when they go to their doctors and ask for help, their doctors say, take this medication. And so even if there were alternatives, they're not being presented or don't have access to those alternatives. In in the world that we live in, sometimes that's the best option. Exactly. No, I mean, I'll be I'll be honest. uh, You know, so Herzberg was my advisor through my master's thesis. And you know, for all of you grad students out there, you know that you should read your your advisor's <laughs> books. And uh, and I was never able to read Herzberg's book because I knew that if yeah. I read it, it would send me on a bad spiral. And luckily, by yeah. that point, I was far enough along in my therapy to know, like, there are certain triggers for me that I should avoid. Yeah. And so he's a he's a amazing scholar but like I knew like that was a dangerous point for me and I couldn't read his book because I I would convince myself to right to not take my medication or what have yeah you. So, absolutely and I'm sorry I don't mean to like hijack no, your your not at all I, your, this, is, I, this is a really important point and in fact I write this having just started my first antidepressant because I was so worried. I, I, for those who don't know, I just had a baby not that long ago. I was so worried about having a baby in a pandemic when my kids are not in, in school mm-hmm. half the week, you know, and I was just like the Milltown ad about unraveling around the edges. Like as much you as that's that. like <laughs> you, you're like, hey, that's super misogynist and horrible and, and, you know, all this stuff. But you're also like, yes, yes, unraveling around the edges. So like these advertisers were tapping into feelings that women really did have and they still, and still have, have. Yeah. Right? right. I mean, it's astounding to me how much that Milltown ad could describe the experiences of people right now especially women right Right. Uh, the the added pressures of this moment that we're living in well i think that it's like so insidious that they are tapping into that the the it is the the problem that cannot be named right because and that's so much part of like feminism's argument and radical feminism like no, we have to remake the entire system right we're just putting band-aids on everything yes like women do still feel these problems because we haven't remade the system. Exactly. And, you know, so right. a smart PhD who has four children is still also having to handle all four of those children. Right. While you're in a pandemic. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's why for Dan was so concerned about these, these drugs, because she was saying, this is this huge problem, and we the only way to root it out is through, as you said, systemic change. Like, yeah. we have to overthrow the patriarchy, or it's never going to get better. But what was actually happening is women, on this, like, individual basis, not not having sort of the consciousness that this was really a systemic problem, medicating to make it easier for themselves to accept the position that the patriarchy put them in. And then as long as they were doing that, there would no wouldn't be that systemic change. But right, but then again, that puts Hertz the were, onus exactly. back on individuals, right? Right. And so so like, as that that tells me like, oh, so I shouldn't take my medication exactly. because I'm fighting the patriarchy. Which is da- which is dangerous, <laughs> right? And that's what David says in this chapter that he writes. Like yeah. This is, you know, people are trapped by this, you know, because you can't just say, well, I'm I'm personally going to fight the patriarchy by not taking the medications that are helping yeah. me. Right. You know, um, we're it's, screwed either way, it's basically up. <laughs> it is. Well, and I see here that you wrote something about mommy wine culture, which yeah. I'm completely feeling in yes. quarantine right now. I mean, I literally I am not exaggerating. I have gained 40 pounds in quarantine. I am not lying. And I know yeah. it's all alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's by daily drink. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I really struggled because I was pregnant during most oh. of the like the most severe part of the lockdown. And I thought I was going to go crazy because – 
one of the things that I've always done, and this is just because I, this is how I grew up. My parents were like this as well. Like they had a glass of wine every night or two or three. They weren't drunks. They didn't abuse alcohol ever, ever, ever. It was just our family's way of like, it's just what we do. Sort no, of. my parents were the same um, way. I mean, it was always a drink at five o'clock. Yeah, exactly. Like it is five o'clock. It is time to hit the box of Franzia. And it was like, <laughs> it, it was just a part and it became a big part of like how we like spent time together. And so it meant it means a lot to me more just than like, I have to, <laughs> I have to zonk myself out a little bit with alcohol. But um, so I had to find other things to do, right, which is hard because you couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Um, but like that baby came out and I came home and my husband put a martini in my hand. <laughs> like, glug, glug. I am not kidding. It was that afternoon. And so I, I have a weird relationship to this wine mom culture because on the one hand I see it through the lens that for, for Dan would see it, right? She would see it as this, a, a modern version of Valium, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you are Sedating struggling. Yourself. Yeah, you are struggling in your situation because of the stresses that are particularly placed on women. And instead of overthrowing the system, you are drinking your Francia. Mm -hmm. But. Um, Medication and so it's, for the masses. Yeah, people. There have been a lot of articles over the past couple of years that have taken this wine, wine mom culture to task and how it sort of encourages. um I don't know, sort of, oh, I don't know, people drinking too much, not not necessarily alcoholism, but like a kind of alcoholism, I guess, which right. I, I don't I don't. Well, think and again, it's, it's so gendered, bad, like, but... oh, it's OK for for a husband to come home and have a glass of scotch after a long exactly. day. But if right. a woman has her woman has her mommy juice, then then right. she's a bad mom and she's a drunk. Yeah, right. And it's come to be associated with a certain kind of like white Karen. suburban <laughs> womanhood right like it, yeah. it's really strange that we were having this conversation right now because i i was just listening to the new york times podcast the daily and their most recent episode was about white suburban female voters and like mm -hmm. how they were really um shocked into kind of a reawakening after 2016 and one of the ways that this woman in the podcast was working to organize white suburban voters female supporter female suburban voters in Ohio was by putting together these wine and politics clubs where women would come together on like their Pinterest perfect patios yeah. and like sit and drink white wine together or like in the, the, the actual just, you know, image they were giving was like, it was fall and they were all sitting outside wrapped in cozy blankets around right. a fire drinking red wine. And I was like, that is such a, that is such a thing, right? Like, I, I don't even know what, really how to describe it, but it's um, it amazed me that there was this kind of confluence of being political and also having this kind of like embracing the mom red well, wine culture. You know, and my whole pushback is like, well, what the fuck's wrong with that then? Let them, right. because they're being political. So just because yeah. they're not being political in the way that you want them to be, right. there's something wrong with it. Yeah. Like, Which I has always, a long history, right? Well, of course. I always yeah. think back to, I saw this, like, it was before memes, but it was this thing, like, when, like, PETA and, like, animal rights activists were throwing red paint on women wearing furs in New York City. Uh -huh. And you're like, you know what? You never see them going up to a biker who's covered in leather right. pouring paint on them. You see it right. doing, you see them doing it on the little old lady, right? Mm -hmm. Because she's an easy target. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so it's it's just it's ooh, I'm angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I am like, really, this this is the the hill you're going to die on. You're going to get right. angry at ladies for drinking wine and talking about politics. Like, right. Hell, at least they're not voting, you know, voting for you know who, you know, right? I mean? exactly. Like, OK, and so they awoke, but they don't awake the way you like. Therefore, right. Something's wrong with it. It's interesting, too, because it like sort of taps into like a really long history of women kind of reforming political engagement in feminine terms, right? I mean, like, right. The, this is, like, what your work is often about, right? About, like, maternalist politics. Right, right. Um, and so I think that it's been really soundly criticized recently because of because it's reliance on alcohol. But I don't know. I, I like wine, so I'm okay with it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. I mean, yeah, obviously we could go into deeper issues about, like, alcohol being a social 
uh, drug, right? And right. so there are certain social gatherings that can't happen around alcohol and or without alcohol. And and, mm-hmm. and that is a valid that is a valid uh, thing that we should right engage yeah. in because I mean it is so. Uh, hard for so many people and and having you know a family that deals with addiction on an everyday level like I get it Mm -hmm. like there are major issues with this Mm -hmm. um on the other hand like all right well let's let's talk about guys at a bar then like why does it always have to be around women doing it right heaven forbid women get together and do something like let's Mm -hmm. criticize it yep typical (laughs) so yeah so I don't know I guess at the end of the day I just see it as a big feminist rant like no, fuck patriarchy. And if we yes. need our wine to deal with your fucking right. bullshit, yeah, yeah, then, then let Absolutely. us. Absolutely, <laughs> I agree. All right, well, that's enough uh, wine talk for now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening and being a valued listener. We really appreciate it. Remember to leave us a five star review. It does help us find new, or it helps new Absolutely. listeners find us. So we definitely love. Yeah, and it makes our day reviews, whenever we please. get a nice one. You, we really do read them. I know and, we do. Yeah. We share them and yeah, we share yeah. them in our group chat. And we're like, it, oh, it really yeah. helps so. us to to kind of recognize that there are people that listen to us <laughs> and that like us. Yeah. And to keep slogging yeah, exactly. through this. It's tough. You know? <laughs> it's tough. Um, it if is, you are on Facebook, you can join our Facebook pod squad which is just a fun place to talk about history and share uh, funny pictures and memes and things like that. Um, you can visit our website for our transcripts for every episode, except for a couple of very old ones. Um, we also have a new section on the website called for educators that is specifically for all of you out there trying to, you know, teach with new digital tools. And we're going to be updating and working on that over the next few months as well and adding some new resources to it. If you really do want us to do an episode about Freud, uh, send us an email and let us know. <laughs> you can email us at um, hello at digpodcast.org. Am I forgetting anything? Oh, you can support us on Patreon um, and give us right. your money if you feel so inclined. Uh, but, you know, things are hard out there, so don't feel like you need to in order to listen. We, we appreciate every single one of you for listening and supporting us in the ways that you can. All right. Elizabeth, let's go pop our mill town. I'm down. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>